Good evening, Columbia. I'm Trudy Gilfillian, the state's opinion editor, and I want to thank you for joining us tonight for what is sure to be an informative, lively discussion about the issues that matter to you. All four of the candidates seeking to serve as Columbia's next mayor are taking part in tonight's virtual event. The candidates are former District 3 City Councilman Mo Bedora, at-large City Councilwoman Tamika Isaac Devine, Sam Johnson, former Chief of Staff to our current mayor, and District 4 City Councilman Daniel Rickman. Tonight, each candidate will be given one minute to make their opening statement, and then we will jump into the question portion of the event, focused on public safety, economic development, and equal opportunity. Questions include those compiled, compiled by our team and submitted by our audience members. We're also excited to feature questions from the next generation. Students from Richland School District 1 have submitted their questions via video. Candidates will be given one to two minutes to respond to each question, depending on the question, and our timekeepers will indicate how much time is left at the bottom of your screen. So with that, let's begin. We're gonna start in alphabetical order with opening statements. Each candidate has one minute to make their opening remarks, and we'll start with Mr. Bedora. Take it away. Uh, thank you all for having me. I, I just uh, wanna take a moment and, and give you a little history about myself. Uh, I, I'm in Columbia in 1980. Uh, I was a young man follow, uh, to follow my uncle, Andy uh, of Andy's American Dream. Um, I want to build Columbia where anybody can come and achieve their American dream and be part of our country. Uh, and American dream without uh, ending corruption, uh, make our city safe and clean city, uh, provide quality of life like clean water and clean sewer, and uh, invest in our small businesses and, and uh, by eliminating business license fee. And lastly, uh, I want to uh, redevelop or develop the riverfront and uh, make uh, a new place for new small businesses to uh, come and uh, blossom and achieve their American dreams. It's important uh, that we realize that as a father, as a single father of two, uh, we want to uh, leave our city to a better, a better place for our children and every child uh, that's in the city uh, for them to achieve their American dream and be successful and to raise their family right here in Colombia. Uh, there's a lot to do. Uh, as, as we go through this forum, uh, you'll see I am the only candidate with uh, direct answers and solutions to a lot of the problems that we have in the city. And uh, for that, I think I am the best candidate for the job. Uh, you can look me up at uh, mo for mayor number four for mayor.com, uh, or you can email me uh, at uh, mo at uh, mo for mayor.com. And then, uh, of course, my cell phone number is 803 318 3111, 803 318 3111 for any question if you want to talk to me uh, personally. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we had a little adjustment with the time there, so we're going to make it two minutes. And our next person will be Mrs. Devine. You have two minutes for your opening remarks. Oh, I believe you're muted there. Awesome. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Good evening, Columbia. I'm at-large Councilwoman Tamika Isaac Devine and candidate for mayor of the city of Columbia. Columbia is home for me. This is the city that raised me. It's the city where I started my career as a practicing attorney many years ago. It's the city where I met and married my husband. And it's the city where we have intentionally decided to raise our children. It's the city that's taught me about community and it's taught me about service. And that is why I have decided to run for mayor because I have humbly served the city for the last 19 years. And together we've done a lot from making sure that we are investing in our infrastructure and making wise, uh, decisions as far as spending, also expanding programs for youth and combating youth violence and investing in recruiting and retaining our best and brightest. But there's still so much more that needs to be done. And that's why I'm running for mayor. I'm running for mayor to be an independent voice, someone who champions all communities and who is promoting inclusive and equitable growth throughout the city. So no matter where you live, whether it is Shandon or Rosewood, North Columbia or Wood Creek Farms, you know that you have a champion in the mayor's office. 
Together, we can sh make sure that we are addressing our most pressing issues, like coming out of the pandemic, uh, investing in our infrastructure, uh, promoting green energy and jobs, uh, combating crime and recruiting, retaining officers, and making sure that our young people have the most, uh, all the opportunities available to them. I am excited about this race. I look forward to engaging with you throughout this, throughout this race. And I know that as a city council person, we have worked together and I've provided real solutions uh, to the problems that we face. But as mayor, we can do so much more together. So thank you so much. I look forward to the questions this evening. And uh, if you want to find more about my campaign, you can go for divineformayor.com. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we'll move to Mr. Johnson. Two minutes for your opening statement, please. Well, I'm going to try my best to, to stick to one. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. I want to thank the state. I want to thank your, your viewers this evening uh, for this amazing opportunity. Six years ago this week, 11 trillion gallons of water fell from the sky, leaving our families without homes or jobs and $12 billion in property damage. Days later, as many of our families are still trying to dig themselves out of the wreckage, you know what the big item on city council's agenda was? It was increasing pay for council members. I remember talking to families who lost everything that week, and I couldn't believe that some council members thought now's a good time for a pay raise. While every candidate tonight is going to tell you that they support our first responders, in 2009, Councilman Devine and Councilman Rickman cut firefighter holidays in half, and then Mr. Badero voted against security cameras, police officer raises, and against over $4 million in new public safety funding. My opponents combined for 40 years on city council, and they can't do better than that. If they couldn't do it in 40 years, they can't do it in four. I'm running for mayor because we need a fresh start here in Columbia. We don't need the same old empty slogans and broken promises. We need new ideas, new energy, real solutions, and real leadership. My name is Sam Johnson, and I'm running for mayor because I want to make sure we take Columbia forward and bring progress to the city. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Now, Mr. Rickenman, two minutes for your opening remarks, please. Thank you very much. My name is Daniel Rickenman, and I'm running for mayor of Columbia. And I'm running because over the last decade, we've seen only 2% growth. We haven't embraced outside investment. We haven't sold our city. We haven't done the things that we can to take the hurdles out so that the working families have opportunity to succeed. I have seen it from both sides, both from the business side and from the government side. So I know what the solutions are. We have to invest internally. We have to have a safer, smarter and stronger city. When I'm talking about safer, I'm talking about continuing to invest like we have for years in our fire department, our police department, giving them the technology, the training and the equipment that they need to fight the crimes. It was mentioned here earlier about 2009, but if you remember, that was a terrible time in our community when we had uh, a recession that came through. And guess what? We all dug our heels together. We came through as the chairman of the budget committee. I came up with a plan that turned around and gave us, when the new mayor took over, a reserve account and financial balance. We talk about smarter. We talk about investing in technologies like good roads and giving our employees the ability to do their job and show us the customer service that they could provide if they have the tools and the talent and the training that will allow them to make sure that we are efficient and effective. We talk about stronger. That's selling our city. That's taking the hurdles out of the way so investment can come here. High taxes, permitting uncertainty, everything that keeps a small businessman from making his way in this world and following that dream. That's why I'm running for mayor. Thank you so much. Appreciate all your opening statements. And now we're going to get to our questions. We're going to start in the arena of public safety and we'll start with Mrs. Devine. You'll have two minutes to answer this question. What would be your approach to reducing crime in the city of Columbia? Thank you so much, Trudy, for that question. Uh, I think, number one, as a, as a former prosecutor, I understand uh, crime and I understand our criminal justice system. But I also understand that we can't worry about always policing ourselves out of crime prevention, but we have to invest in our communities. We have to have a comprehensive approach to making sure that we are decreasing crime. 
And so my solutions for that is number one, investing in retaining and recruiting our best officers, making sure that we have officers who live in the communities that they police, make sure that they have the best equipment uh, and they're utilizing technology to the best of their ability, but also making sure that they are building relationships within the community so the community feels like law enforcement is a partner with them in combating crime. We need to also make sure that we are investing in resources in our communities so that uh, we are addressing the real root causes for crime, such as poverty, such as economic immobility, uh, such as access to guns. And so my evidence-based solutions that we'll be presenting uh, to help reduce crime, uh, reduce gun violence within our community, but also investing in our young people so that they have options, so that they are not picking up guns, but they're picking up books. As a leader on the city council, I've worked diligently to build relationships, not just with law enforcement, but in communities. And I can be that bridge and be that leader to make sure that we are investing in our community in a way that crime prevention is not a law enforcement issue, but it's a community solution and we'll all work together for. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we'll go to Mr. Johnson. Same question, two minutes. What would be your approach to reducing crime in the city? So I think there's a couple things that we have to do. We have to create more opportunity here in Columbia. A lot of, a lot of crimes are crimes of opportunity. So we have to make sure that we are growing as a city, that we are, uh, are focusing on some of our challenges. We gotta make sure that our children see the very best education here. One of the reasons I'm running is because I, when I look at my 16 month old, I wanna make sure that she's gonna have every tool in her quiver. I'm gonna make sure, I wanna make sure that she's gonna be able to live up to her God given potential right here in Columbia. We gotta have the best school district possible. We have to have a mayor who's willing and able to work with our school board and our school district to create the very best education system, an uh, education system that people seek out and search out. We've got to make sure that the city is doing more. And so we've got to look at some of our assets, like our parks, our recreation centers that are located all across the city. We got to, how do we utilize them and, and expand our after school program so that children are able to get a hot meal after three o'clock? We'll make sure that education is able to continue so these kids keep learning even when they're out of school making sure that parents that haven't got off of work yet know that their kid is going to be somewhere safe uh, somewhere that they're going uh, where, where, where they know that there are opportunities that are uh, and that are loving individuals who are pouring into them we've got to create those types of wins here in Columbia we need those types of free programs that that show that we're here trying to make sure that everyone is going to be successful that opportunity is available to everybody we got to make sure we got to embrace new ideas in our youth and education plan. Not only do we talk about a free after school program, we talk about the Columbia Career Academy, an opportunity for us to partner with Richland One and Richland Two with Midlands Tech and create more job skill uh, training programs to, to make sure that everyone, whether you're a youth or you're somebody who's looking to learn new skills, make sure that everyone is employable and able to get some of these uh, some of these jobs that we know are out there and available to everyone. And then we got to focus on public safety. We've got 93 vacancies right now in our police department. We've got to have a priority. And that's why we put a 10-year team, a contract on the table, making sure that we embrace new ideas to, to hire, hire folks. Thank you. And same question to Mr. Rickenman. What would be your approach to reducing crime in the city? Two minutes, please. Thank you very much. Well, you know, here we are. It's a four-legged stool, folks. And, and the first leg is our police department. We need to make sure that we're hiring and we're retaining those officers. And that's being creative. It's not, it's a, of course about take home cars, technology, making sure that we're getting the cameras and the equipment and the training that keeps them safe. But it's also about making sure that we look at how they have pay, pay bands and how they can work through that system so they're allowed to have flexibility so we can retain officers who want to be complete patrol officers and not move up but still have the ability to to earn a living and then cross training and paying those officers who cross train a higher wage so that we can utilize them when we're down we've been through wars we've been through floods we've been through this pandemic so we're always going to have a, a, a issue with filling positions here and there but we have 52 sworn officers out right now so hiring and retaining those are important but retention also involves making sure that we have wellness programs not only me mental but health programs for those officers so that we're taking care of them physically and mentally then we have to deal with uh, what we call the technology piece, making sure that the, the technology is there for both the community 
and the police officers, keeping them safe. The body cams that tie into the cars, the citywide camera system, the shot spotters. And then we need to deal with the judicial issue, which is, is judges constantly letting out career criminals and uh, gun offenses over and over and over. And then lastly, the mayor has to make public safety priority number one. And that's my commitment to you, Columbia. Thank you so much. Same question to Mr. Bedora, and you'll have two minutes. What would be thank more thank you for that question. I, uh, you know, I'm a, bit, I'm a big supporter of the police department and safety of our city. Uh, from day one, my campaign uh, launched and uh, we talked about community policing and uh, reintroducing substations uh, in the neighborhoods. What does that really mean? Uh, when I would talk about community police, and it's funny how everybody else is start talking about community police and after I introduced it, uh, it's basically you you put uh, the police officers in, in the community so they can understand and learn about the community and the persons that live in the community and try to avoid any, uh, try to stop the young men and women from uh, acting or behave or uh, do a criminal act. Uh, and, and that's like, for example, joining a gang. So it's important that police officers get involved with everyday uh, everyday life for the community and our young children. Uh, at the same time, we need to introduce uh, substations in our community. I've made it clear uh, that substation can be located at a park. Uh, when you take a survey, uh, how many people would know what the police station is? Uh, not half people would know what the police station is, but then over 90% of them, uh, they know what the park is. So it's important that we put substation, police substations on our park. Uh, so the allegation that I voted against cameras, I, I think uh, uh, Sam Johnson must have been uh, partying the Sheraton rooftop when I voted for uh, the cameras and to support uh, funding for the police officers or the police department from the day I got elected in 2012. Uh, in, in fact, I, uh, some of the, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the things that I ran for in, in 2012 is to uh, provide security, ca or security cameras and body cameras for our officers. And we've done that, uh, but we need to do more. We need to invest in our police officers. We need to send them to school so they can learn more, so they can advance in their career, whether in the city of Columbia or anywhere else in their life. Uh, we need to make sure that they have all the tools they need. Nobody is gonna sit here and tell you we're gonna cut down police uh, department and funding. Uh, we, we are in, we're gonna invest in the police department and our officers and our police chief uh, for the day end. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Next question, and some of you've touched upon this a little bit, but you can expand on it. We're gonna start with Mr. Johnson for this one and you'll have two minutes. The question is leaders at the Columbia Police Department and Columbia Fire Department have each acknowledged they have frontline officer and firefighter staff shortages. How can we not only get those critical positions filled, but keep them filled consistently? Mr. Johnson. Sure, I wanna to clarify too, we have 52 patrol officer vacancies, 12 corporal vacancies, 13 investigator vacancies, we have sergeants, lieutenants, and captains, leadership within our police department that, uh, that those positions are vacant right now. We have 59 senior firefighter vacancies alone right now, not to mention other positions within our fire department uh, that, that, are, uh, that are short right now. We, just this past Saturday, we had two of our fire engines that were closed because they didn't have enough people to run the truck. This weekend, the weekend before, we had two engines that were closed. The Saturday before that, we had three that were closed. And so we see the manifestation of these vacancies right now. We need leadership here. Our idea is a 10-year contract, making sure that both the police and the fire department have base salaries that are able to attract officers, but then making a commitment that years three, five, and eight, we're gonna give them not only a, a pay raise, but a retention bonus, so that we know that uh, as we look at the culture within our, both our police and our fire departments, they know that we care. We know that we want the best departments. But in order to do that, we also, uh, in order to keep them, in order for them to re you know, receive those bonuses, they've got to also live up to their end of the bargain, right? They've got to make sure that they have uh, strong records in our community. They've got to make sure that they are, uh, are, are certified and getting trainings that uh, allow them to be able to handle some of the challenges that come with being a 21st century police officer and firefighter. And so th those are some of the solutions that we're bringing to the table. You know, we've got to make sure that we're investing and thinking very creatively, bringing new, new bold ideas to the table. Ideas like a mortgage program, uh, take-home cars, one-to-one -one take home cars. So right now we have take-home cars, but we, we're not able to do it one-to-one, -one. Make, make, meaning that every police officer is able to have a take-home car. And so they're, they're visible and, uh, and, and known and seen in their communities. We've got to make sure that we're encouraging that type of 
and investment and leadership in our police department. That's the type of leadership that we need as mayor uh, and that we'll bring to the table. Thank you so much. Same question to Mr. Rickenman. You, you know, we're competing against everybody today, unfortunately. Today, if you ride down I-20 from Lexington into Columbia, right before Highway 6, you're going to see a billboard that says Phoenix, Arizona PD now hiring starting salary at $83,000. We have people who are poaching our uh, employees because we do such a great job in training. We have such a great quality of life here. But to keep the talent and to attract it, we have to be competitive. And competitive means that it's not just all about money, it's about the respect. Number one, we need to show support to not only by being vocal about it, but being there with equipment and training and take home cars. As we've discussed, we don't have enough, but for $8 million, we can fix that problem. We have an opportunity to invest in, in the body cam system that connects to the cars and to the cloud, which then will allow not only safety for the officer, but for the community. So when we do these things, nine million, we have about $27 million worth of needs in the, in the police department. And these are things that make employees want to come work here. It makes officers feel safe and they understand that we support them. We need to work on the pay bands, as I mentioned earlier, to give the flexibility within the department to do what they need to do to keep the best and the brightest where they are. We need to make sure that we're recruiting people from our community that know our community as we build up that trust and that relationship. As mayor, I'm going to walk around with an application for the police department in my pocket. I'm going to offer it to anybody who's willing to step up, get trained and be part of fixing the solutions in their neighborhoods. And then, of course, we've talked a lot about technology and training, which I can't say enough because so many of our calls are dealing with homeless and others. So crisis training is critical. We need to make sure we give them the tools and the support teams of social workers to fix this. Thank you. Thank you. Same question to Mr. Bedora. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I don't want to keep repeating a lot of the stuff that has been said, uh, but of course, um, and you know, we need to invest in our police department by giving our police officers more raises and more money to be competitive with the other departments around the city. Uh, it's important that we uh, we we support our police officers, uh, and that's why the community policing is the key to improve. Uh, the way police officers believe themselves and believe that they're making a difference in our community. When they see a young man, uh, when they were ab they're able to stop a young man from going into uh, gangs or uh, committing a crime, it makes them feel good. But at the same time, we need to give them that stability and that support they need. And they need to feel safe in a, in a city that they feel. And when I say, when I mean, what I mean by safe, it's we need to end the corruption. We need to end the corruption at the city level that the city officers and the police and the citizens of the city uh, feel it and understand there are no more uh, hitting deals uh, behind cl closed doors that uh, accountability and and justice has been served uh, and i keep repeating the same example the Allen benedict court how two people died 400 misplaced and uh, policemen and and firemen were out there every single day trying to help every victim in that complex until this day, there is no justice has been served, no accountability has been served. And it's a, it's a sickening feeling for anybody that works in the police department and the fire department and even lives in our city that somebody got away with murder, literally got away with murder. And we need to stop the corruption. That's how you recruit officers. That's how you recruit uh, citizens. And that's how you increase the population for the city. We need to make sure we stand tall and against corruption and bring justice and accountability to the ones who deserve to be uh, put in jail or to, to answer to their mistakes. And in this case, a killing for two people and misplace of 400 people. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the same question to Mrs. Devine. Thank you, Trudy. Uh, I'll tell you, officer recruitment and retention is a very important issue. But I think we also have to understand the challenges that come with uh, the job of being an officer. You know, there's been a lot of conversation about the vacancies uh, and we have lost a significant number of officers in the last year. 
Well, we do exit interviews when these officers leave. And I'll tell you, the vast majority of the folks either retired because it's been a really tough year for law enforcement, especially uh, in the conversations we've had across this country. But we've also lost some that have left the profession altogether. And so we have to understand why are officers leaving the uh, profession? This is not just a city of Columbia issue, but it is a profession issue. And so we have to make sure that we are investing uh, in our officers and we are getting them training so that career officers, those who want to be police officers, uh, they feel protected, they feel supported, and they have the resources. A few things that I plan to implement as your next mayor is making sure that we are uh, looking at pay as one thing, uh, and we certainly need to increase the starting salary and make sure that we deal with compression issues. But we also can look at innovative ways to supplement the salary of law enforcement officers. I propose to having uh, the city of Columbia, we buy houses throughout the city all the time with our CDBG money. We rehab these houses and we put them for sale. What if we don't sell these houses, but we make them available for officers to live in the communities that they serve rent or mortgage free? That re significantly reduces their living expenses. We also need to look at a cadet program and look at how do we recruit officers, uh, especially from our two great HBCUs here in the city of Columbia, Allen and, and um, Benedict. They both have great criminal justice programs. How do we recruit those students and get a pipeline into our officers? Also, we need to make sure that we are supporting our officers with making sure that they are able to do policing. And so the issues that they deal with, with mental health and others, that we have social workers, which I advocated for. And now we have a CIT uh, unit that has it. So those are some of the things. So there's a lot more. You can see it at my website. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we're going to play our first student question. So if you don't watch the video and this is going to be the next question and we're going to start answers with Mr. Rickenman. Go ahead and play the video, please. Hello, my name is Adriana Williams, student body president at St. Johnson High School. What would you do as mayor to make people feel safe when calling the police? We'll start with Mr. Rickenman. You have one minute. I did not hear the last part of her question. I heard her. I, I didn't hear it at all. She asked, what would you do to make people feel safer when they call the police? So there's some concern about people calling the police and not being helped. Oh, I think this goes back to what we talked about as engaging the community, making sure that we're recruiting people from the communities that have trust factor and doing everything we can to get into a community with and gaining that trust. If it's picnics, it's porch talks, it's walking through the neighborhood, getting the feet back on the street so people know these officers are our friends and are there to help and create relationships instead of this distrust. A lot of this is about us as a whole community coming together and constantly working together to address this. It, it's a tough issue because some people have this disdain, distrust for officers and part of it's reforming our judicial system. And I think we have to do that. We have to make sure that those folks who need to be in jail are in jail and those folks who shouldn't be there aren't. And we got to show that folks, when you commit a crime, you pay, you do the time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mr. Bedora, same question. One minute, please. Um, you know, I don't want to say the answer is simple, but the answer is what I said earlier, community policing. That's why uh, you, you need community policing and police officers to uh, understand the community and, and have one on one with every single uh, community member uh, on the streets. They, uh, they should know each other's first name. They should know each other mom and dad. At the same time, we need to have a substation that, that, that where everybody knows what it is if they need help. It's important that we build the trust back between police officers and our community, period. Uh, we, we, nobody wants to see another George Floyd ever happen again. And, and this is our chance to make it work. Uh, it is our chance to make community policing back in our uh, process, in our system, in our policy. As mayor, I will be the first one to uh, engage. The first week we, do, we, we will support and hire police officers that understand what community policing is all about and building relationship. Uh, between police officers and the community itself. Uh, community policing is the way to go to improve the, the trust uh, between community and police officers. Thank you so much, Mrs. Devine. Mm -hmm. uh, thank her for that question. Uh, and CA Johnson is an amazing school, Richland One School. Um, and I know that community very well. And I, I talk to families in there and I know that there is a distrust, but there's also the thought that, you know, when people call, will law enforcement really show up? Uh, 
You know, one thing that ShotSpotter showed us when we invested in that technology uh, and we'll be expanding that technology is that there are so many times that there's gunfire in communities and no one calls the police. As I talk to people in communities every single day, I find that sometimes people aren't called the police because they're worried that either law enforcement's not going to show up or if they've shown up that uh, they're not going to respond appropriately. The Columbia Police Department has done a great job at making sure that we have uh, training. We have done crisis intervention training. We have done sensitivity training. We've done diversity training. And I think part of what you do is expand those things. As a leader on the national level at National League of Cities, I work with the Race, Equity, and Leadership Council, and we have policies and procedures that law enforcement that not just build communities, but also have communities understanding uh, what law enforcement role is like so that we can build those partnerships. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Johnson, same question for you. Well, thank you to the, uh, the home of the Mighty Green Hornets, the C.A. Johnson uh, Mighty Green Hornets. I appreciate this excellent question. I'm going to tell you, this is a multi-tier question. One is a capacity issue. We've got to make sure that we fill those vacancies. Right? One of the issues is we talk about trust. When you call 911, it's because there's an issue. Uh, and it's a pressing issue. You know, you can't wait 30 minutes for someone to arrive. You need somebody to arrive now. Uh, you, need to make some, make, you need to make sure that, that while safety may have been lost, that you're able to regain it quickly. Uh, you got to make sure that you're calling uh, and that you know, you're receiving someone who's got the training and knows how to deal with that issue as well. But I'm also going to tell you, part of uh, filling those vacancies also goes back to having the, the manpower uh, to build trust, to make sure that you're able to, to build those relationships in the community so these officers are able to get out of their patrol cars and build relationships in the community. As somebody who's a young black male, understand that challenge. We've got to make sure that we deal with some of the societal challenges that we have here and have a mayor who understands those. Thank you all so much. Um, our next question, you'll have one minute to respond. The city has long talked about plans for better bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, but many cyclists and residents remain frustrated that there hasn't been more done with con connectivity in the city. What would you do to change that? And we'll start with Mr. Bedora. One minute, please. Great. Thank you for that. Um, when I was on council, we've adopted a plan uh, to uh, increase connectivity between neighborhoods and throughout the city. And we've uh, built in some bike lanes and some uh, plans for bike lanes and uh, walk, of course, sidewalks and everything else. Uh, the, so uh, the, the issue or, or the challenge here is every neighborhood is different. Uh, there are some neighborhoods who welcome uh, bike lanes and some neighborhoods don't. Uh, for example, I think uh, city council uh, voted uh, after the uh, DOT uh, uh, installed a bike lane uh, on one of the local streets or city streets. The neighborhood uh, was upset about it, and they, uh, of course, we spent taxpayers' money to remove it. So it's important that we uh, communicate and plan ahead or plan with the neighborhood into what they want to do and how we can come about it and how we can uh, in, uh, invest in our neighborhood, in our bike, bike lanes, and connectivity. Uh, and uh, the way to do that is get the public and the neighborhood involved. Thank you. Same question to Mrs. Devine. Thank you. It is so very important that we have a leadership who understands multimodal means of transportation, and that includes making sure that our city is bicycle friendly and pedestrian friendly and safe. Uh, as a member of city council and as someone who understands the need that we having a plan and we have our walk by Columbia plan, having a plan is great, but you have to have the resources to invest in that plan. And so I specifically lobby uh, to make sure that we have that money. And uh, thanks to Congressman Clyburn, who is a supporter of me and my campaign, we've gotten $40 million to implement by, uh, Walk by Columbia. And so now you will start seeing those bike lanes and connectivity. You also have to have real leadership and understand uh, that Mr. Bedore is right. Not every community might understand the need for bike lanes, but we need to have a, a leadership who understands educating the community about the necess necessity of having bike lanes. And so as a, a biker myself and someone who has got support from many people in the biking community, I plan to be that leader in making sure that not only we implementing Walk Back Columbia, but we are connecting and getting more people out of cars and on bikes and walking. Thank you. And same question to Mr. Johnson. I think you know part of it. We have a, an amazing amount of talent that served on our BPAC committee, uh, on the city's BPAC committee over the years, and we've had a number of folks who resigned. Uh, and while we have plans, we've had discussions. You know, folks want to see implementation, and part of the 
part of the challenges around implementation that we've had and that we've seen is that we haven't had one, uh, you know, someone who's dedicated, who's focused on this thing day in, day out, making sure that it comes to fruition. We need to make sure that as a, as, as a city, we have that. Uh, and so we gotta have a, a, somebody on staff who says, we're moving the needle uh, in this space here. We gotta make sure we have dedicated funding as well, uh, which was mentioned uh, earlier, I think, by uh, uh, Councilman Badura and Councilwoman Devine. Uh, but we also have to make sure that we have uh, folks who uh, are able, to, at the end of the day, to understand the growing and, uh, and the challenges that we have here in our community, uh, understand how uh, technology comes into place, how uh, as uh, changes in quality of life becomes more and more important after this pandemic, that we understand how to make sure these things happen. Thank you. And same question to Mr. Rickenman. I think for us, first of all, we got to finish the projects we already have on the books. You know, the connectivity to our greenways, the riverfront. If we can finish those first and foremost, then we can concentrate on getting into and bringing the biking piece to it. But if we don't have the other connectivity, we're just doing blocks here and blocks there. We had ULI did a plan in 2014 that wasn't adopted, which causes calls for us to do road diets, bringing in the roads so that we have more connectivity so that we can go from Lincoln Street to West Columbia and from, from the hospital all the way through Elmwood Park to the riverfront. We need to finish these projects first before we start taking on others. We also need to invest in more sidewalks and stronger streets and infrastructure in neighborhoods, not only for safety, but to give that connectivity and that walkability. So we've got a lot of things to do that we have to take one step at a time, but let's finish some projects first. Thank you all. We're gonna switch gears uh, to economic development. This question will go to Mrs. Devine first. You'll have two minutes to answer. What is your approach to economic and workforce development, particularly as Columbia emerges from the COVID-19 pandemic? Mrs. Devine. Thank you so much. Um, I say all the time, COVID has unearthed a lot of disparities, but it's also presented us with a lot of opportunities. I think out of COVID, we need to think about how do we reimagine work? And when we talk about reimagining work, there are jobs that are currently here, but there's also jobs in the future. But we have to make sure that we have the workforce necessary to fill those, fill those jobs. There's a lot of talk about the tax study and, and what that revealed. But we also had another study recently, and it was a survey by Deloitte. And the number one reason that some companies choose not to come to Columbia is because of the workforce not being able to fill the jobs that they have. And so as mayor, I plan to expand the programs that I've already started, like the work initiative program that I co-chaired many years ago uh, that, that taught skills to our returning citizens and others so that they could learn a skill and then get employed. But we need to expand that for jobs of the future. And so have those programs for insurance tech, have those programs uh, for entrepreneurship, having those programs that will increase our people's opportunity to not only start and grow a business in the city of Columbia, but if they choose to go work for someone else, that there is upward, there's upward mobility in those jobs. And so having workforce development programs are very important. And we have to make sure that we are partnering with Midlands Tech, which is a, our great technical college here, but also looking at uh, having a, a programs like the CDL program that I help, I work with Richland One to start uh, in high school students so that high school students can actually get their CDL license before they graduate. And then once they graduate, they're immediately employable. And so using that model, we can have lots of workforce development programs that actually fill the jobs, again, not just currently available, but the opportunities that we have um, moving forward. And, and that is would be part of my plan. And then also making sure that our other higher education institutions and our businesses do internships with our higher education um, institutions. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Johnson. Well, this is an area uh, that, uh, one, I think we have to be very open to new ideas. Uh, so you know, we've got to be very focused on growth. How do we grow here? Uh, you know, one of those studies, uh, I think Ms. Devine mentioned earlier, focus on the age groups of 25 to 45 year olds and how we lag behind as a city in comparison to the Asheville's and uh, the Charleston's and Greenville's and the Raleigh's of the world. We've got to focus on how do we uh, how do we grow there? How do we make sure that young families, young talent either stays here in Columbia or we're able to attract them? We got to have a plan. We got to know exactly what our economic development plan is, and then we got to put it in action. Uh, and we have to have a mayor who understands where we're going as a society and as a community. 
We've got to have an economic uh, development toolkit, something that allows for us to be competitive. Uh, it, you can talk about uh, the, our tax challenges and the property tax uh, uh, challenges uh, all you want, but at the end of the day, if we're not making sure that we are competitive, that we're able to do what we can on the local level to mitigate some of those challenges, then guys, we're going to continue to lag behind those other cities. So we've got to make sure that we're creating opportunities for us uh, in the insurance technology and healthcare technology clusters. We've got to make sure that we're attracting growth, uh, uh, wonderful opportunities there, knowledge economy jobs that allow us to paint and, and showcase what we have to offer. We have 60,000 students that graduate from University of South Carolina, Benedict College, Allen University, every year. We've got to make sure we're putting that talent to work. And when it comes to workforce development, we've got to focus on new ideas like our, like our Columbia Career Academy, something that allows for us to, to focus on teaching and training folks around plumbing, HVAC, welding. You know, we look at uh, some of the training programs that we have now, but we got to think bigger and broader. How do we create more capacity there so we're able to churn out more talent? Columbia has to be the talent magnet of the Southeast, and we can do it. We've got all the right tools, all the right assets already. Thank you. And now to Mr. Rickenman. We have a great opportunity. The pandemic has really changed the way the U.S. is restructuring and looking. And if you look, the Sun Belt, where we're located, has had 6% growth. Unfortunately, Columbia has only had 2% growth over the last decade. We have a great opportunity to economists, investment bankers, developers, uh, institutional lenders are all saying we're going to have double digit growth here. But we're also we got to get the hurdles out of the way. We can talk about the Deloitte study, but if you dig into the Deloitte study, unfortunately, most of those businesses weren't located in the city, so they don't have the same challenges that we do. Taxes are a big challenge. Unpredictable uh, permitting is a big challenge. Making it hard for the small business to get in there is a really big challenge. Chris Healy, who's here to help us create soil conditions that are right for investment, for small entrepreneur growth said it best. Our city government tries to control everything instead of collaborating and getting out of the way. So if we wanna be competitive, our economic development team needs to be out there recruiting, recruiting development teams that are bringing jobs and businesses here. It's, this is what other communities, Nashville, Lexington, Kentucky, Charlotte, Greenville, are all doing, but let's also face the fact we're competing against right across the river at West Columbia, where they're making it business friendly for people to invest and get things done. Their employees are making decisions on site, not sending everybody to a team. So when we talk about jobs and that, we got to have a basis and a soil conditions to get those and a training program that goes with that. And there's so many options here, but we got to make the soil conditions right to make that happen. And Mr. Bedora. Economic development, it's, uh, and yeah, we can talk all about the taxes you want, you know, uh, whether we have higher taxes than any other counties in the state or not. Uh, the, the, the matter of fact is uh, you can't really uh, control that as much because there's three different agencies, government agencies can control what you pay at the end of the day. Uh, for property taxes. Uh, but me, Mo Bedura, is the one who's going to cut your taxes by eliminating business license fee for all small businesses with $500,000 in revenue or less than four employees. I, Mo Bedura, will make, will cut all the red tape and all the corruption into uh, when you try to open a small business. Uh, for example, I'll give you an example, park invariance. Uh, that if you are in anywhere in the city you'll have and you don't have enough parking you'll have to apply for a parking variance and you'll have to wait for the committee to come and approve the parking variance there are challenges out there there's a lot of red tape that we need to eliminate at the same time we need to invest in our technical colleges we need to come up with a trade with a program for uh, to develop and train uh, new trades for young uh, adults and not only that but bring companies from out of state uh, to uh, can hire our young talent that is graduating from all the colleges and the, and the technical colleges and the universities we have in the city. We, it's important that we keep our young talent here instead of going somewhere else. And the taxes, you might you can argue about all of that all you want, but I'm going to tell you, Mo Bedura will not go up in your taxes while he's mayor. And that is the promise I will make. I will, I will eliminate business license fee for small businesses. I will secure the red tape is gone and eliminate it for any small business or any business and come to want to open a business in Colombia. 
I am the one who is for pro business because I understand I am a small businessman myself. I have been through the, the pandemic. I've opened my restaurant in the middle of the pandemic, which by the way, we just celebrated our one year anniversary just last Friday. And I encourage everybody to invest in our city for all the small businesses. But lastly, let's develop the riverfront. And I know how to develop it and I know how to fund it. Thank you so much. Our next question, well, you'll have two minutes to answer, was submitted by one of our readers. And we're going to start with Mr. Johnson. What are your priorities regarding Columbia's infrastructure? And how will you make sure Columbia neighborhoods are treated equally when prioritizing infrastructure projects? Mr. Johnson. So one, we've got to be more responsive as a city. Um, so I think about Louisville, Kentucky, for example. They have a, a program that makes a promise to every citizen uh, in their city. Uh, you can go, you can use our app, you can use social media. And you can submit, hey, we've got a pothole here. We've got a water main right there. And they will fix that issue within 48 hours. They will get you a response within 48 hours. That's the kind of level, that's the level of service, that's the level of technology utilization that we have to bring to Columbia. But along with that, we gotta focus on some of the other challenges that face uh, that we face here in Columbia as it relates to infrastructure, like beautification. People make a judgment call on the capital city uh, of Columbia when they come in off of some of our major thoroughfares. As someone who's an Elmwood Park resident, me and my wife Ashley are raising our our 60-month-old little, uh, little girl, Kennedy, uh, in Elmwood Park. And we want to make sure that uh, when you look down Elmwood Park, you've got very uh, very power lines, that you've got grass that's been cut, that you've got a thoroughfare that showcases just how beautiful and gorgeous you can expect the rest of the city to look like. And that's the type of things that we have to make sure we focus on. Thank you. Mr. Rickman, one minute for the same question, please. Oh, I think this is a great opportunity to deal with with making sure that both all our corridors and our neighborhoods, number one complaint I get is potholes and water leaks. And that this goes back to doing effective efficiency and training and giving the tools and technology. So Good Roads is a technology that was developed in an incubator that connects to a truck and gives us real-time data. That real-time data then can go into another program called Doppler, which then goes in and shoots out a work order. Here's our opportunity to, to make it more effective and efficient. We have more female and minority owned contracting companies in this town than any other city in Columbia, working with them and creating a network where that work order goes to them. So within the first 24 hours, that hole or that pothole is filled and within 48 hours it's paid. At the same time, we're creating wealth for small businesses. This is how we deal with this challenge, both in neighborhoods and business corridors. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bedora. Oh, thank you for that question. So I'll answer in, a, in a two different ways. When we talk about infrastructure, we're talking about uh, water and sewer uh, department. And uh, yes, uh, there's a, a couple of mentions about steel plates and water leaks. Yes. And that's because uh, both the uh, councilwoman, uh, Tamika Isaac Devine and Daniel Rickman uh, continue to transfer water uh, uh, funds out of the water and sewer. And instead of investing in the water system, and put new lines under these roads so we will not have steel plates, we will not have water leaks. And not only that, but we will improve the quality of life and the quality of water that we supply for our citizens. It's important that we uh, uh, not only support the technology uh, where you can uh, report an incident or a leak or a problem, but also to follow up. My, my as mayor, I will put the department heads uh, evaluation uh, on public for the public to evaluate the department heads, whether it comes to uh, water break uh, repairs or road repairs or sidewalk repairs. It's important that the, the department heads start to uh, help uh, cannibal and, and uh, to follow up what the citizens are, are, are hearing and talking about and displeased with. Thank you. And same question for Mrs. Devine. Thank you so much, Trudy. And infrastructure is very important. Uh, and we have been in investing in our water and sewer infrastructure, unlike uh, Mr. Medora uh, erroneously mentioned, there has not been transfers from water and sewer, and we have committed to clean water 2020. And not only did we do what the EPA required, but we've done more projects to make sure that we are investing in our infrastructure and technology. But when you think about infrastructure, you also have to think about our roads uh, and investing in that and sidewalks and making sure that we are not only in investing in keeping them up and maintaining them, but making sure they're safe and secure. You're looking at all, uh, all intersections. 
then we also have to make sure we're thinking about our human infrastructure as well, our rivers, our, 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 built, our natural infrastructure. And so as a National League of Cities board member, I've been lobbying for the American Jobs Plan and the resources that will be coming to our community will help us tremendously tremendously in investing in this infrastructure. And your question also asked about equity, nobody's in, um, talked about that. I will have a director of diversity and inclusion to make sure that everything we do is with an equitable lens. And we know we have to invest in communities of color that have been disinvested in for so many years. Thank you so much. We're gonna play another uh, set of student questions. We're gonna start this one with Mr. Rickenman and uh, we'll play that question now. Please watch the video. You'll have one minute to respond. Hi, my name is Andrea Stevens and I'm a senior at Deer High School and our question is, how can we bring economic industry to Columbia to make them more successful like Greenville and Charleston? Hello, my name is Molly edwards Lyman, and I'm a senior at the Richland Middle College. My question for you today is what is your plan to help the communities and businesses that are currently struggling economically? Okay, which question are we answering here? I'm sorry, in case um, you, you couldn't hear, we'll give you both questions. Um, so the first one was, what do we do to make Columbia more like Greenville and Charleston um, and other communities? And the second question was, how do we have more economic, uh, sorry, economic opportunity? Um, and I'm we'll answering you, both of those in one minute. You know what? We'll give you two. You're right. Let's give you okay. two. <laughs> That's, I was going to say that was a little hard. Number one, I, I, I love that y'all are asking these questions uh, and thank you uh, for them. First of all, we don't want to be Greenville or Charleston. Yes, we want the investment that Greenville and Charleston, but we want to be Columbia. We are the capital city and we should be the number one city. Today, it's all about recruitment and it's all about investing internally, because if, if we have high taxes, poor schools and people think that we're a high crime, those are detriments. But these are all things that we know we can fix. So if we deal with recruitment, if we go out and we meet with the development teams right now, when I was talking to development teams from Lexington, Kentucky and Columbus, Ohio, which are growing by leaps and bounds, when you talk to them, they're, they're telling me, hey, we're going out there and seeing who's building, who's attracting. Uh, I, I met with some folks in Atlanta and I said, what are y'all doing to get these tech companies from California? They go, we've met with the developers. The developers have the relationship and they're coming, but they want to be business friendly and they want to have a quality of life. Well, we have quality of life, which is fantastic. And I'm so excited that, that, that we have that asset. Now we got to fix the hurdles and we have to go out and recruit. We have to sell our city. We don't sell our city. We've missed so many opportunities to really shine the light on what a great community are and the people that we have here and the talent that we have that can support those businesses. Um, and I can't remember the second question now. Basically about student, um, how do we improve economic development generally? Well, and, and I think we go along those lines and we need to engage. We, ha we have 55,000 students that are here and we need to be working with them and engaging them and making them feel welcome, but also making the soil conditions so they can start a business and that we have more opportunities here. We want people to have opportunities that are available in every other city because we are the capital city and we deserve that but we have to tackle the hurdles that we know are right in front of us to clear the path and open up for private investment. Thank you. Same questions to Mr. Bedora. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, we're not, we're not Greenville or Charleston. I don't have an ocean on the backyard and I don't have a man's uh, front yard. So, so it's important that we realize the uh, geographic, it's not there. Uh, we're a government college, uh, army base kind of city, uh, but that shouldn't stop us from uh, being the number one in the capital city for the state, right? Uh, so it's important that we do everything we can uh, to keep our young talent here uh, by in investing or bringing more companies and uh, bringing more development, uh, redevelop the riverfront, create more opportunities, more job, and even entrepreneurship. Uh, but let's let's be honest, folks. You know. Young kids and people don't want to move to Columbia, where uh, the, the local government never did a, a thing about uh, the Ellen Benedict Court tragedy, where two people died, 400 people misplaced from their homes in the middle of the day uh, due to negligence. And uh, nobody was held accountable. Nobody was uh, justice was never served. Uh, it's important that we take care of that uh, so people can stay here and want to move here to Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, it's important that we uh, maintain our water and sewer system and give our citizens 
quality of life that they deserve. Uh, you don't hear that in, in Greenville and Charleston where they have brown water and uh, uh, steel plates all over the road because it doesn't happen. They take care of their water system and they care of their citizens and the quality of life. It's important that we go uh, and improve the quality of life that we can. As in economic development, like I mentioned before, uh, I think redeveloping the uh, riverfront will create a lot more opportunities for development to come in, uh, whether it's small businesses, whether it's hotels, whether it's companies or anything else that would uh, benefit from the riverfront itself. And uh, hopefully that will attract young uh, talent to stay here. Uh, we may not have an ocean, but we will have a riverfront for uh, young talent to stay here and so they can enjoy life and enjoy the quality of life uh, that our city government should be providing. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Mrs. Devine. Thank you. Um, and I agree with Councilman Rickman in that, you know, Greenville and Charleston have great assets, but they're not Columbia and we want to be Columbia. Columbia has tremendous opportunities and we have to have a leader who can take advantage of those opportunities and make sure that we are building a more inclusive and equitable city. And that's why I love this question um, from a young person about economic opportunity. When you think about economic opportunity, you have to understand that there are parts of our city that have been left out of uh, investment. You know, we've, we can spend millions of dollars on Bull Street and Main Street, but we have to sit, if we've spent a portion of that in other areas and create economic opportunity, help people grow jobs, build businesses, uh, create entrepreneurship, those will create economic opportunity. As a council person, I made sure that we started our Columbia Kids Save, where we're teaching uh, kindergartners how to save. Also, we've taught them about entrepreneurship and they've started businesses uh, by making uh, bracelets and uh, paying pictures and selling those and then invest uh, and then saving those dollars. And so we're teaching young people about uh, economic mobility and building wealth. As a member of council, I've expanded our programs for home ownership. And that's how you have economic opportunity when you can uh, when you can expand home ownership opportunities where people can really have an opportunity to build wealth. And that's why it is so important that we have a director of diversity and inclusion uh, and we look at everything that we do in the city of Columbia from a lens of equity. One thing that Greenville and Charleston has done that the city of Columbia needs to is they have uh, ec uh, equity strategic plans. We've now done an equity survey and we have to move forward with a strategic plan so that we are increasing that economic opportunity. And as the next mayor, that will be a number one priority for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Mr. Johnson. Sure. Uh, when I was in the mayor's office, I got that question a, a good bit about Greenville and Charleston. I'll tell you, um, I guess you don't run for office, run for mayor and not be a little competitive. Uh, we're the capital city of the state. Uh, we're one of the 50 capitals in this, in this, uh, in this great country. Um, we, uh, you know, those are great cities. Um, I love uh, visiting them, uh, but we are the crown jewel of the state. Uh, and there's a reason for it. We have uh, uh, the river is here. We have uh, higher education. We've got Fort Jackson. We've got uh, our hospital systems. We have so much uh, to offer, uh, but we've got to make sure uh, that as we look at what we have to offer, uh, you know, as you compare with those two cities in particular, you know, look at landmass, for example. We are a much bigger size city. Uh, you know, Greenville uh, and, and both Charleston uh, are, uh, if even combined, aren't, uh, aren't, aren't Columbia. You know, we've got to make sure that we have uh, better arrows uh, in our quiver. We've got to make sure that we have uh, the very best education that you can uh, that you can hope for. That when you roll, enroll your children in one of our schools, no matter where that school is located, you know that that school in Columbia is going to provide your children with a quality education. We've got to make sure that we are bringing more young families uh, to Columbia. And we talk about Bull Street. You got to think about things like Gigabit, right? The first Gigabit community in this state. Cap Gemini, for example, which came here because of that gigabit in internet, hires uh, computer science students from the University of South Carolina straight out of college. These kids are making uh, $80,000. Those are the types of opportunities that help us grow and expand. We've got to make sure that we're diversifying our economy, like we talked about before, knowledge economy jobs. We've got to make sure that uh, as we talk about creating more economic opportunity here in Columbia, those are the types of things that we have to focus on. We've got to figure out how do we how do we grow and change? How do we think beyond where we are today? How do we make sure that young talent wants to be here in Columbia? That's why I'm running for me. Thank you. We're going to play our last student video of the evening. If you could take a look at the video and then you're going to have one minute to answer this question. We'll start with Mr. Bedora. Hello. 
My name is Blonzy Lewis. I'm a senior and a student body president at Eau Claire High School. My question is, what would be your main focus when it comes to improving the economy in our community? For example, what is being done to add grocery stores and restaurants in the North Main and Monticello Road areas? <laughs> Mr. Bedora. And I, some of it I kind of, I didn't, I didn't hear. Oh, she was asking about how do we get rid of food deserts in certain parts of town and bring more restaurants to parts of town that don't currently have them. <laughs> okay, well, uh, thank you for that answer. Uh, I, uh, you know, we've, we've had that question a couple of times and uh, there was a lot of answers uh, were out there, thrown out there. Uh, one is to uh, motivate grocery stores to come um, and, and give them tax incentives to come and open uh, and reduce uh, uh, food deserts in the neighborhoods. Uh, at the same time, uh, the last time we had a uh, discussion, uh, I mentioned that I met uh, a gentleman uh, that has a grocery store on wheels. It's like a food truck, but it's a grocery store. Uh, the city should provide the land for a grocery store on wheels, uh, anywhere that is in the food desert to promote uh, more food, we, um, food uh, grocery stores on wheel uh, to come and service the community. Uh, so it's important that we can be part of that. Uh, so if, if you think about it, you can have uh, three or four different uh, trucks or trailers uh, with groceries in them, one for fresh produce, one for canned food, one for meat. You get the idea. Uh, as in for restaurants, promoting more restaurants uh, as a restaurateur, and I've done this for a while, and I, uh, I, I graduated uh, with USC with uh, HRTM and master's. Uh, I got to finish this. <laughs> You can do it. Make it 30 quick. seconds. <laughs> 30, I'll make it a quick. Uh, it's important that we uh, we cut down the red tape. Uh, for example, the grease trap that re that's required for a restaurant, uh, restaurant tours or a new restaurant, it's impossible for anybody or new restaurants to do unless if you're a big company. So it's important that we support that and find ways to motivate them and incentivize that somehow where the city can uh, adapt and help the small businesses and small restaurants to open in food desert. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Devine. Thank you, Blazine, for that question uh, and seeing you at Eau Claire. My grandfather was a teacher at Eau Claire and he was teacher of the year. And uh, thinking about your question and food deserts, I remember uh, they lived in Greenview and I was over there every single weekend. And I remember we would walk up the street to the community grocery store and we would buy cereal and eggs and things. And there are so many, uh, op there are so many opportunities to bring back community grocery stores. And so as mayor, I think addressing uh, economic opportunities investing in communities that have been disinvested is very, very important. And some creative ideas are looking at creating back those models where you have independent grocery stores, community grocery stores, so that we can uh, have those in our community. Also, mobile food markets, which we actually are working on one at the City of Columbia and should be unleashing very soon. Uh, we also have to make sure that we're investing in uh, communities that have been disinvested in and understand the root causes. Economic um, or food deserts are a result of years of disinvestment and economic uh, opportunities that have not had been in those communities. And so as mayor, you need a leader who will be able to lead and make sure that we're not only incentivizing, but we're investing in those communities and bringing about those changes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Before you start my time, I'll tell you, uh, Councilman Badura and Councilman Devine went long, so we, a minute isn't long enough for this one. Uh, we've got to focus on density. We've got to create, uh, you know, when you look at the grocery store model, they, 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 uh, their model, their formula uh, for grocery stores, they want to see your traffic count. So we've got to create more, uh, more density in some of our areas. Uh, and we've got to think about also how do we incentivize and create more uh, allow their model to be successful. So something like economic overlay districts is something that's in our e economic development plan. It showcases and, and makes sure that some of the challenges that we have, some of the missing links that we have in our communities like grocery stores and, and pharmacies, that we're able to incentivize that here in Columbia. But we, in, the, in the meantime, while we wait for these grocery stores uh, and while we, while we work towards that, we've got to look at new ideas like solar fridges, uh, expanding our community gardens program. We've got to uh, look at uh, the co-op model. Um, making sure that uh, we're, we're taking our community and working together with our community to, to bring grocery stores and a co-op grocery store to our community. Those are the types of things that we have to look at. We have to also look at our parks and recreation infrastructure. We've got parks all around the city and making sure that we utilize those as pop-up markets uh, as well. Thank you. And Mr. Rickenman. 
Yes. Yeah, so, so we need to make it a priority. And as mayor, I will make it a priority, but we got to get the hurdles out of the way. You know, the grease trap was mentioned earlier, but you also have the sewer expansion fee that could cost 30 or $40,000. We need to eliminate these. We need to take advantage of the choice neighborhood grants and leverage it so that we can build buildings and get these small neighborhood grocery stores and services and bring back family owned restaurants and local restaurants like Pierre's Turkey Wings or Burt's Grill, all these things that have deep history and rooted in these communities and bring back the services. But the only way we can do that is if we make it a priority invest, take the hurdles out of the way so that we can make it easy for people to, to take that step into entrepreneurship and help us plan and, and locate and make sure that what we're doing gets people the needs that they need in, in a fair manner, because right now asking somebody to take a bus all the way across town to lug groceries back is not fair. Thank you so much. Our next question was submitted by one of our readers. You'll have two minutes. What would you do as mayor to address issues affecting the LGBTQ community and to ensure that members of that community have their voices heard when the city's making decisions? We'll start with Mrs. Devine. Thank you for that question. Uh, and when I say that I am running to be an independent voice and a champion for all communities, I truly believe and mean all communities. Uh, and so as a member of city council, I've led on these issues. Uh, I voted for, I, I proposed and voted for um, our inclusion ordinance uh, and non-discrimination ordinance. Uh, we did our hate crime ordinance and we made sure that the LGBTQ plus um, LGBTQIA plus community was included in uh, protected classification. Uh, just this year, I championed uh, the ban on conversion therapy and uh, the uh, establishment of our ACE committee, advisory committee on equality to make sure that we have uh, people from the LGBTQIA plus community and allies that are advising the mayor members of city council on a regular basis as to our policies, our programs, our services, and how we are building a more inclusive community. And so as mayor, I will continue that leadership and make sure that not only uh, do I involve um, people uh, in every aspect, no matter where you are in the city, but also every community and make sure that not only do you have a voice in the mayor's office, but you have a champion who's going to be fighting for more inclusion and, and, and inclusion and equity. Um, I also have to say that we can't be um, thinking about uh, how to grow our city and be uh, um, more inclusive and also economic development if we are not looking and celebrating the diversity of our community. So as mayor, I will continue to champion that. And I always tell people, if you wanna know what somebody will do, look what they have done. I've always been a champion uh, for all communities in this city and will continue to do so. But with the mayor's office and the spirit behind the mayor's office, we can build that inclusive, equitable community that we all want. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I remember uh, during my time in the mayor's office, one of the things that, uh, one of the conversations that, uh, that the city had, um, this city, which is the most diverse city in the state by far, uh, there was a conversation around uh, a human rights commission. Uh, and part of that was a human rights ordinance. And that conversation got hijacked. That conversation uh, needed leadership. Uh, and while Mayor Benjamin proposed it, uh, it didn't have uh, the support from the rest of council to make sure it actually happened. I'd show the leadership to make sure uh, that, we, that we brought that to fruition, that we got that done, that we have a chief diversity officer in the city, uh, that we make sure that our boards, our, our commissions, that the talent that we have on display in the city that we all know is here, uh, that is evident as you walk up and down these streets, making sure that that is included in every element of our uh, decision-making process, from our boards and our commissions to all of the wonderful opportunities that we have here in this city to engage uh, the talent uh, inclusive folks that, uh, that, that we need to. Uh, one of the things that I think we also have to make sure that we're looking at is how do we bring new folks to the table? How do we make sure that whether they're LGBTQ folks who, are, who live here, who are residents, uh, whether they're uh, uh, folks who are uh, uh, visiting, i.e. some of our students, uh, whether it's the uh, folks at University of South Carolina, Benedict College, Allen University, making sure that there are a smooth process for them to get engaged in the city, for them to feel welcome and at home in the city, for them to know that this is a place where we want you, we want your talent, we want everything that you have to offer because we need you. That's the kind of mayor that we have to have. We have to have a mayor who thinks forward, who's a part of uh, the future of this city. That's what I think I bring to the table, and that's what I think our values have to be. They have to be on display for Columbia. 
Thank you, Mr. Rickman. Yes, uh, it's a great question. Yeah, you know, the reality is is that this city council and on the terms I've served before, we we've done everything from making sure fair housing. Uh, laws were changed. We, we've talked about hate crime. I think there were f at least five different issues over the years that we've worked together. We've had a great relationship with Open Dial. And there are also issues that we're not going to agree on, but we have to have that dialogue and work together. And that's what's great about having seven votes and seven voices and working together. As, you, as Ms. Devine mentioned earlier, we had, uh, we've gone with the ACE Committee for on equality, which is a step forward, which was voted by all of council to work together to initiate and work as a team to make sure that we have inclusion. You know, inclusion means dialogue. Inclusion means that your voice is heard, but it doesn't mean that we always agree on everything. And we have to learn how to disagree on certain issues and how to work forward and make sure that the issues that we are doing forward benefit all communities and not just one segment. And I think we're making those steps and have made those steps over at least the last decade that I've been involved on council. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity for us to continue to grow as a community and work together and have dialogue. And that being at the table and having the dialogue is the key for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Bedora. Mr. Bedora, are you able to hear us? You seem to be having some technical difficulties at the moment. Uh, all right. I mean, I see everybody. Okay, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I was, was not muted, I promise you. Um, so there's a lot been said about uh, bringing people and, and, and all kind of different people to come and talk to uh, and, and communicate and understand each other. Uh, and, and Sorry, uh, we're, having, we're having government and hearing it's, you, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. We had some technical problem there. I believe we were having difficulty. Uh, and I, I, this I'm still here. If you're able to give us 30 more seconds, if you can, it, it, we're having a problem. It, it seems to be your internet connection. It, lo it looks like we'll have to move on, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. Um, we're going to go to our closing now. Um, we come near the end of our program. Just wanted to give you each 30 seconds um, just to, to give a farewell, give your best, share your, your website address, whatever you'd like to do. Um, we'll start with Mr. Uh, Rickman. Yes, I'm Daniel Rickman, and thank you all, all for joining. I'm very excited to have this opportunity to run for mayor as the son of an a immigrant, a first-generation American, one who challenged and grew up in a single household and challenged with dyslexia. Now, I'm living the dream every day, and I want to make sure that in our community, I aim to change so that everybody has an opportunity to fulfill their dreams and that it's not the insiders that get rich, but the working families have an opportunity to grow and create wealth. Thank you, and I hope you'll consider voting for me. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. Imagine a Columbia that fills potholes as soon as you know them, that builds grocery stores in your neighborhood where you don't have to worry about politicians lining their pockets. That's the type of Columbia that we have. To go That's our Columbia. There's got to be your Columbia. I'm focused. I'm running for mayor because I want to bring those new ideas, creative ideas, uh, a new conversation to Columbia. It's time, y'all. My name is Sam Johnson. I'm running for mayor. You can find out more about our policies on our website, samjohnsonformayor.com. I've enjoyed this discussion in, uh, this evening, and I'm so thankful for the opportunity to have this dialogue as we approach November 2nd. I want everyone to make sure that you are uh, making an educated decision as you vote on who's going to be the next mayor of the city. As we look to move this city forward and make sure that every child is able to receive an amazing education and reach their God-given potential here in the city. As somebody who is born and raised here, at the, the, the child of 
uh, a uh, Alzheimer's, nurse, Alzheimer's nurse and a truck driver. I know it's like to try to move forward, uh, to come from a working class family. Those are the types of challenges that I know all too well. I'm so thankful for this conversation and look forward to engaging with you all between now and November. Mrs. Devine. Thank you so much and thank all of you for tuning in tonight. I'm Tamika Isaac Devine and I'm running for mayor of the city of Columbia. I'm running for mayor to be an independent voice. Someone who is championing all means for inclusive and equitable growth. My career has been built on bringing people together, bringing real solutions and making sure that everyone has a voice. I am passionate about this city. I love this city. I've talked to you directly tonight. I didn't have to read statements or watch, uh, read my notes to tell you about the programs that I want to bring to the city of Columbia because I know these programs. I live these solutions and we uh, together will be able to bring these solutions to the city of Columbia to continue to build on what we've done. I've had the opportunity to work with two amazing mayors, Mayor Bob Coble and Mayor Steve Benjamin. I didn't work for them, I worked with them at and I've done the job. I am ready on day one. I have proven experienced leadership and I'm ready to move the city forward. And so I ask for your support and I would love for you to go to our website at divineformayor.com to learn more about our policies and programs and what I have done and what I will do as your next mayor. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Mr. Bedora, if your signal's with us, you can say goodbye. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I appreciate your time and 